Hi guys. So I just did an interview with Carolina Prepper and um, Brad from the Big Family Homestead. And the audio kept kinking in and out a little bit. And so you'll be able to watch those in a little bit when they put them up. But I wanted to address some of the things that were the most important subjects that came up and um, the questions that they asked that I felt like were the most pertinent to my channel. So I thought I'd go into them a little bit right now. Um, the question came up, what would I suggest for a beginning homesteader? And my knee-jerk reaction is to say, go get this book. Because um, it shows you how to bloom where you're planted how to succeed where you are, how to see results without shifting your family to a new property or feeling like you need to quit your job in order to make money doing homesteading. Homesteading initially, in the beginning, what it was was it, it was an act by Congress that allowed any man, any, I think you had to be 19, I think you had to be 19 in order to participate but you could go out west and you would get a certain number of acres. The only qualification was you had to go register that this these were the acres that you wanted. And you had to stay on those acreage, that acreage for seven years. And once you'd stayed on it for seven years, full time, that could be that your family stayed there and you went and worked somewhere else, but somebody in your family had to be on that property for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, it was your property. You didn't have to pay for it. Um, the, the thing was is that in the West, things were different than they were back East. And it was hard for people to do that. They had the storms. They had the wind. They had the Indians. They had drought. And so a lot of people didn't make it. Or they did make it the seven years. And then they ended up leaving anyway because it was really rough. And homesteading nowadays can be the same. If you go into it with the idea that you're going to make money, um, and you quit your day job, you, you could be in for a really rude awakening because um, it, it takes time to develop systems. It takes time to develop relationships with people that give you better prices on your feed. And um, if you're doing it as a, as a nuclear, nuclear family, and everybody's not on board with it, it can cause friction in your home life. And so I, I thought about what I said in that interview and in the end what it came down to was I don't necessarily recommend homesteading first off. If your goal is self-reliance and you're wanting to have a better, more secure future for your family in uncertain times, this is the book I would get. just in case. And um, I would work on your food storage. I would work on having a year's supply of food and a three month supply of water in your home. And I would focus my money on that because gardens come and go and some years are successful and some years are not. You saw that with Growing in Faith Farms. They had so much rain this year they weren't able to plant their garden. However, if they have buckets of grain, rice, beans, peas, salt, sugar, honey, herbs stored, then it will get them through to the next season if there if we were in a, if we were in a situation where, where stores were not up, it would give you that leeway and that um, that space to get the next season right, to survive this season if times were really, really hard. And um, I know they live in a really small space, so I'm just gonna use them for an example because they are they weren't able to plant a garden. It's not because I think they don't have these things, but um, when, when we were first married, we lived in a 600 square foot house and we didn't have room for storage, not really. We had the two, gal is it two pounds is it what is it those big coffee can size cans i had those stacked up in the closets in the shelves in the closets of our bedroom had that packed and stacked full always be careful of height or not height weight limitations on stuff like that you don't want those coming down on your head um, i had food storage stuffed under our beds 
and so everything under our bed was food storage. I had food storage under my kids' beds, and I had we had a little tiny mud room where I had stacked things up about three feet deep and by about ten feet long and then eight feet tall uh, in five gallon buckets and then we also had a couple hundred gallons of water stored back there as well plus our water filtration systems and um, and then in my kitchen I had five gallon buckets and cupboards underneath the island so just about any storage space that I had I had food storage in it and we had about a two year supply two year food supply in our little house, our little 600 square foot house. And um, we also had a food storage in our crawl space. And so I also at the same time was gardening and also at the same time I had chickens and also at the same time I had goats and rabbits and ducks. But before I got the goats and rabbits and ducks, I got my food storage. And so for those of you who are wondering where to start on this, I would say be a prepper first. Not a prepper with a tinfoil hat who, um, you know, you mortgage, you do get a second mortgage on your house so that you can buy the blast shelter for your backyard. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying get some food. Make sure you, and, and by some food, I don't mean a one week supply of stuff in cardboard boxes. I mean, get whole grains, and put them in a sterilized five gallon bucket, seal it down, label it, and store that. Um, because that is a huge amount of condensed nutrition in a small space that's easy to cart around and if you have flooding, it's not going to seep through your cardboard and ruin things. You don't want ready-made flour in those buckets. Um, they take up, way, uh, flour takes up way more space than whole grains and it does not have the same shelf life. It doesn't have the same nutritional content as whole grains. So you don't want to do flowers. Um, about the only powder you want around is gonna be salt. Um, and I would keep lard in little buckets too, not necessarily in glass. I keep it in glass just because I've already got oil in other storage spaces. Um, you want fat you want salt, you want some kind of sweetener. If you eat a lot of chocolate, you want to get cocoa or baker's chocolate and put that in a bucket. Everything needs to be in buckets and sealed. You can go to bakeries, that's where we get our buckets. So rather than spending five or ten dollars a bucket, we go to local bakeries like at Smith's or Albertson's and usually they sell them for a dollar a piece and you can take them home and wash them out, make sure they're really really dry before you put anything in them and then you fill them up with your grains, not in little bags, but just put them in. Um, if, you want to, if you want to put them in bags, that's fine. It just takes up a little bit more space and it's a little more expensive. Uh, I like to, if it's something I use a lot, I put it in a one quart bag and Ziploc it and put it in, in the uh, bucket that way. And that way when I cook with it, I just pull out the bag rather than getting messy or having spills. Um, or I can send my kids down to get a little bag out of the bucket and again no spills. Um, it, it's I think it cost us $700 to get our one year uh, food storage for our family when it was just me and Mr. Dirt. $700 and um, that was just because we knew where to get it. We went to a local um, uh, feed store and they had food grade 50 gallon drums, plastic drums, and that's and they cost us 20 bucks a piece and we filled them with water and it just yeah this is a really good book especially if you have kids it talks about what to do in certain emergencies and how to get your food storage ready um, Let's see, another really, if, if you want information on how to do a one or two year food storage, I would look up um, the LDS Church on Food Preparedness. There's lots of articles on it there. They're very comprehensive. I'm trying to think if there was a book in particular that I liked. I don't like most of those books just because they're, they can be a little bit um, doom and gloom, emergency scary stuff, and it doesn't have to be. 
Um, for me, one of the reasons that I went from prepping to homesteading is that I can't eat grain. I have to have meat and it can't be canned. It can't be have behind preservatives or overcooked for me to be healthy. And so the responsible thing for me was to raise my animals on the hoof um, to make sure that they could propagate themselves so that I always have my own meat on hand and in an emergency situation I wouldn't die. That I mean, to me that just sounds like responsibility that I would take my own food needs into hand and keep them in mind when I'm pre preparing our family's food storage. And so, once you have your water food, your water storage, once you have your your dry goods in buckets, good book, then you can move to uh, the backyard homestead. And this book is invaluable because it gives you a sense of uh, a sense of what is possible on a sm in a small space. A lot of the people that are doing market gardens now and making their living on them are only doing it on like a quarter of an acre. Um, the, the market gardener is doing it on one and a half acres and he's pulling in $150,000 a year. But he's doing that because he understands how to garden. If, you're, if you quit your job um, to do something you've never done before, you wouldn't give that advice to your 20-something son. Quit your job, go do something you've never done before that's just a pipe dream, and um, I expect you to be able to make money off of it and not go into debt. And the, the wiser thing would be to find something you love about homesteading and invest your time and money in that while you still have a job. Um, because a lot of people look at it and think, oh, I want to, I want to go and homestead and do that for a living, and I don't, I don't know anybody that's done that. Even the farmers markets around here, um, they went and got a grant from the government to put in a $15,000 greenhouse and yet he still has a day job because um, it's seasonal and um, they're not able, if he's doing a big garden, he's not able to raise livestock because he just doesn't have the time. It can, it can be a lot of, um, a lot of juggling with schedules and with, uh, with feed and expenses and it's just start small. Let it be a hobby first and um, take care of yourself. Make sure you're still eating well. That's a really big deal. If you're not taking care of your own body then you can't take care of all the other animals and children and husband and or wife that are counting on you. <laughs> Pardon me. So, um, there we go. We'll see if we can get up some more videos today. But I thought I'd just put that out for you. Make sure to watch for the interview. It was fun. I will. I don't know if I'm going to put up on my channel the whole thing. Probably a little bit of it. And then you can go watch it on their channels. And we'll talk to you later.